B doesn't stand for Bitcoin. Yeah. Next up, please help me welcome Dr. Stephanie Murphy to the stage. She is a professional voice actor with numerous credits, including national commercials, videos, and audiobook titles. She's formerly a biochemist. She's been involved in the Bitcoin world since 2011 has been, and has been hosting Let's Talk Bitcoin since 2013. She can also be heard on a podcast of her own, Sex and Science Hour. Have you guys checked that out? Yeah. yeah. It's rad. Next up, Jonathan Mohan. Please come to the stage. He is the most recent addition to the LTB crew. And finally, Andreas Antonopoulos rounds up. Give it up. Have a great show, guys. Thank you, Pamela. <laughs> You ever feel like you're being watched? <laughs> yeah, I have that feeling right now. So, hey everybody, my name is Adam B. Levine. Thank you very much for joining us today on this episode of Let's Talk Bitcoin, which is something of a first for us. Uh, I guess I don't need to do introductions today. So, in 2013, we started my third or fourth Bitcoin podcast, the first under my real name, uh, and got started and just really never stopped running. It was five years ago, almost to the day, it was on the 23rd of April, 2013, that we released our first episode of the show. And, <laughs> and you know, just thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for listening. And thank you so much for all of your stories about the impact that the show has had. And just in general, getting excited about this technology and the ideas behind it that we've been excited about for so, so long. This is a surreal experience, and just once again, I'd like to thank you all for being here with us today. So, with that in mind, today I'd like to announce our ICO. <laughs> I'm glad you guys laughed at that. <laughs> uh, so, I'm actually not kidding. Um, we're doing an initial clothes author offering. Uh, we've got shirts printed, <laughs> and uh, if you... Uh, help us with some proof of work then uh, and ask a question during the episode then you're gonna get one of these shirts for free they say proof of shirts 100% guaranteed bots don't wear clothes so you can wear one of these shirts and know for sure that you are a real person and most importantly they're free so <laughs> if you uh, if you ask a question during the episode please make sure that you do get one of these shirts there should be a volunteer to hand one to you at the time that you ask the question okay so without further ado let's get right into it the structure of today's show we've got several topics Topic discussions to go through and during each one we're going to accept probably one or two questions from the audience so there's probably gonna be a total of 14 questions uh, if you want to line up you're welcome to do that um, the microphone is over there in the dark so uh, someone will uh, help you find your way over there uh, and without further ado let's get into it so one of the first things that we talked about I, I just recently re-listened to the first 10 episodes in preparation for this and uh, one of the first topics we talked about was the idea of moving Bitcoin in our minds from, uh, from the Bitcoin unit to the millibit unit, right? And this was a topic back in 2013 that we were like, oh, you know, yeah, that would be good to do at some point. Maybe when Bitcoin is $100, <laughs> maybe, maybe at that point it's, it's not, you know, it's, it's ready to go. And, and kind of at this point, I, I'm kind of curious, what do you guys think about this? Is it now finally time to, to move to the millibit or do we still have a ways to go? Stephanie? I think we maybe passed that point a long time ago and it just never happened. Well, what happened then? I don't know. I, people were waiting to move to Satoshi's. <laughs> like a Satoshi is a dollar. I don't know. I guess. Well, the, the bits uh, units has been working quite well. So that's a millionth, right? Yeah, right. I so one bit that. is 100 Satoshi's. And that's nice and round because, you know, a Satoshi is a cent compared to a bit. And that works quite well. But It doesn't know, work well for me. I can't no. do those decimal <laughs> places. Are you kidding? Yeah. Well, I, I, I think it's quite funny if you look at um, a wonderful book called The Book of Satoshi, which is his accumulated writings that Stephanie did the voice narration for. And you look at what Satoshi's writings were, and he said, well, let's just make it eight decimal points, and if we ever need more, we can add it later. <laughs> and like all hard set variables, one set, it's just never been changed. Right. <laughs> so who knows if the Satoshi will be the final say on the lowest denomination of Bitcoin, but I think the, the notion of having a cent integer and a total integer makes a lot of sense when it comes to bits. Just, just to point out that the Lightning Network operates on milli-Satoshis. 
So we're already below Satoshi level. Does anyone else get stuck on thinking about Bitcoin as being worth the price that it was when you first heard about it or you first <laughs> bought one or received one as a gift or something? Because part of me sort of did, you know? I think that that actually has a lot to do with why I still really think about Bitcoin in terms of Bitcoin. I think really the perception of it, you know, it's always been one of those things where the switch to millibits was never really a switch to millibits. It's just changing how each person thinks about it. And so for those of us who got in early, maybe we're just stuck in kind of the past thinking about it in terms of Bitcoin. And people who are getting wallets today, they're already experiencing the future. It's, it's the inverse grandma problem. It gives you 10 <laughs> cents, because back in her day, that was a lot of money. <laughs> we're like, what do you mean? A Bitcoin's like 10 bucks. So I, I want to see it. In a, I want to receive 0.003 Bitcoin. I don't want to receive a billion millibits. You know? Back in my day, it cost two bitcoins to go to a show like this. Oh my god, we got a topic about that later. <laughs> <laughs> so do we want to take any questions from the audience on yeah, this? Yeah, absolutely. So what do you think about millibits, or kind of how do you think about money right now, or bitcoin in terms? Uh, I actually can't see if we have anybody waiting for questions. Is that the case? It looks like we do. Okay, we got a question back Terrific. Here. Okay, go, we've got go, our go first ahead. proof of work t-shirt winner. What's your question? Yeah, you well, this is kind of like a two-part question. Okay. Um, uh, just first one, part. one is for Mr. Andreas. With all the education that you've given us, all the lovely leadership, and the following that you have, how would you feel if we crowned you as the blockchain Beyonce? <laughs> <laughs> Wow. <laughs> That's a hell of a lot better than Jesus. <laughs> I didn't hear a no. <laughs> no that, that's a yes. Definitely yes. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That wasn't a question, though. But, uh, <laughs> Do we have right. another question? How about another question? Something. Bro hey, guys. Uh, I love the show. This actually is not a question about like Satoshi's. I wanted to ask about uh, your thoughts on proof of work versus proof of stake, but that was an answered a little bit earlier, but specifically about what are your thoughts on delegated proof of stake that EOS is using, and do you think that uh, there's a concern that it might lead to some level of centralization, which may lead to some level of distrust within mm -hmm. the community? So. I'd be curious if you have any comments about delegated proof of stake. Everything leads to centralization. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the fundamental thing that people seem to have trouble grasping, is that centralization is a natural outcome of market-based economics. Centralization happens because of economies of scale, because of network effect, because of a number of other factors. Pretty much everything in nature ends up being a power law distribution. You know, like 20% of the... Uh, uh, artists have 80% of the sales. This happens throughout nature, throughout societies, throughout economics. So why would you think it wouldn't happen in our environment? Centralization happens. The question is, how fast does it happen? Can it be resisted? Can you have systems that are resilient to it? And we don't know yet for delegated proof of stake or anything else. We're really discovering. Nobody votes. I don't know. <laughs> right, that's the other problem they, with, they with proof of stake. <laughs> right. right. Yeah. Well, they well did that's the whole thing about delegated proof of stake is that delegated proof of stake allows you to effectively pick representatives and sort of, it's sort of almost a political system to solve this problem. In some ways it has better decentralization characteristics because you know that there's a certain number of people. In other ways it has worse because those parties tend to be identified. Will there be delegated lobbyists as well? Well, so I mean you know, yes. I mean, the yes. So you it. say that yeah. nobody votes, but I'd like to point out that uh, EIP 999, which is the discussion currently about whether Ethereum should bail out the parity multisig, is getting a lot of votes by the people who got their funds locked up in the right. parity multisig. They're in fact the number one voters, and okay. they are absolutely for this proposal. So maybe we'll Shocking. have to change it to say that the incentives have to be aligned for them but to uh, participate. I, I think an interesting way to look at it, rather than give you an answer, is to give you sort of the thought processes behind the different actors in this space. And I, I had the opportunity to um, speak with Dan Larimer about this a lot, and what he thought about uh, delegated proof of stake. 
And one of the things he likes to conceptualize is that one of the biggest state transitions uh, in blockchain was when Bitcoin started to about 2010, 2011, 2013, when it, you got mining pools. And he said that Bitcoin started as proof of work and then transitioned through mining pools to delegated proof of work, where the actual actors took their mining, issued uh, a pool, which they basically delegated the rights to speak on their behalf. And it, it, you had, it's not the difference between delegated proof of work and delegated proof, uh, sorry, proof of work and proof of, uh, delegated proof of stake, but of a framework for delegated proof of work and delegated proof of stake. And that's sort of the argument behind that sort of conceptualization. And then when you look at the way that Dan is evaluating EOS and Vitalik is evaluating Casper, Dan is looking at this notion of a decentralized autonomous corporation, which is that actors in a blockchain should be perceived as shareholders and shareholders vote in their own best interests. Um, and it's a shareholder mechanic for consensus. And if you look at Vitalik, Vitalik says, well, we don't want to trust anybody. We're not a corporation, we're a community. And I want people to be able to be punished for bad actions. So whereas the stake providers in EOS have no mechanism in which to be punished other than to see the price fall, um, in Ethereum, they're looking at a mechanism where the stake to be able to be a um, proof of stake provider actually can be taken away from you. Can, your collateral could be pulled or punished for malfeasant actions. And it's, it's two different philosophical views on um, what should be the characteristics in a stake environment. A lot of that theory has to get tested, and the only way you can test that is real money on the table with adversarial conditions. That's the bottom line. And the, and the really great news is we're about to see this happen across several different networks at real scale with really serious amounts of money and very serious adversarial conditions. Everyone can sing and dance when they're outside of the game. Uh -huh. right? And the proof is what happens when you put real money at risk. We'll find out. And that's the great experiment. So I'd like to announce a hard fork of the show right now. Um, we're changing our proof of work. So now if you ask a question and it isn't about the topic, you don't get a shirt. I'm sorry. <laughs> we're rejecting your we're gonna orphan you. So <laughs> But is there is there ghost in this? Do they get like a half of a t-shirt? Wait, wait, you're gonna orphan <laughs> we're, 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 we're gonna, we're, we're Adam gonna, has unilaterally implanted I, I, LT BIP number yep, that's one. Right. <laughs> yep, it's LT BIP uh, number one, and uh, we've forked our proof of work. So just be aware. You can still ask the questions because we love the questions, but uh, try to keep it on topic if you want the shirt. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> LTV classic. All right, next oh, topic. It. All right, next topic. So the next topic, kind of one of the early things that we talked about was how one of the most difficult parts about cryptocurrencies, and specifically Bitcoin, uh, was that it was really difficult to make the jump from the old world money into the new world money, what we call the fiat bottleneck. So on the one hand, that has to do with things like Coinbase. and In some ways, this problem has been solved. In other ways, the fiat bottleneck is just that, uh, sorry, a little feedback. Uh, the fiat bottleneck um, is built around the idea that like taxes, right? Like taxes are a way that we kind of get bottlenecked. And so it becomes more difficult and easier to kind of get disrupted from what you want to do because you have to focus on all of this other stuff. And really the lesson for me over the last couple of years is that the technology you know, Bitcoin solved that problem, and other protocols are coming out all the time that solve different technological problems. But the problems that we really face as a community and as a movement are not the technology anymore. The technology's been solved. It's everything except the technology at this point that is the greatest challenge in cryptocurrency. What do you think, Stephanie? I don't know if all the technological problems have been solved yet. I mean, it's it's getting better, obviously, but um, there's still a lot of work to be done. I really think the bottleneck comes going the other way from um, cryptocurrency to like you know fiat currency. It's both ways. That's where you uh, encounter the most friction, or at least I do. So I don't know. Um, I haven't done, you know, personally, I think I, I get disincentivized from, like, exchanging very much. You know, if, if I can have crypto, I just keep it as crypto and use it or hold it or whatever. Yeah, for sure. So the bottleneck uh, is a pain. Yeah, it's still a pain. I, we have some work to do. Yeah, they thought that if they shut down the off-ramps, we'd all stay off the freeway. It turns out we'll all stay on the freeway and just keep riding it. Yeah, that's interesting. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, whoops, that didn't work. Well, intended consequences. We turned off the exchanges and they all decided to hodl. <laughs> now what? <laughs> um, 
Yeah, I mean, the, the, the on-ramps, off-ramps issue is, is going to continue being a problem, but one of the things that I've experienced personally is this really radical shift in your mentality when you start earning instead of buying. I haven't bought any crypto since 2013. I occasionally sell in order to pay some expenses, but for the most part, I earn it through my work. And I know that's not the norm, and I know that not everybody can do it, but you'd be surprised as how many people can do it. We are having a discussion about this on uh, Twitter the other day, and people were saying, oh no, not everyone can earn. You have to be a developer or a high-profile person in this space. And George Mandrick came online and said, I baked baklava for Bitcoin in 2012. <laughs> and he literally did. He went to places like Porkfest and sold trays of baklava for Bitcoin. It was one Bitcoin of baklava. It was. <laughs> George did so very well. Good it's proof baklava. of baking. <laughs> The bottom line is it doesn't matter what you do, pick what you do and earn. And I think that causes a very significant shift in your attitude, because you start thinking of this as more as a closed-loop economy, rather than something you convert into and out of. And you will find other people, once you've earned a Bitcoin, you will find people who are willing to take it in order to offer you services. And that's really when we start changing the whole economics of this space, because that's the real opt-out. You know who's the smartest person in Bitcoin? The guy who gets into the coma and doesn't have to pay any taxes because he never sold any of it to this point, right? I mean, like that continues to be the best use case or the best case scenario for a person. Really, at almost any time you started in Bitcoin, except in the last six months. Wait, uh, being in a coma is no, the not best being case in a, scenario? No, I'm just That's saying, like, <laughs> well, I mean, the, the temptation is so there, the temptation is so present, because we assess risk and we assess what we have based on current values relative to past values. We might have expectations for the future, but sort of the more conservative you are when it comes to managing this stuff, the more tax liabilities you incur, the more essentially opportunity costs you wind up having. And so again, like, yeah, I mean, I guess I wouldn't want to be in a coma for other reasons, but from a financial perspective, I think it's the smartest decision I can make. <laughs> I mean, to your argument about how difficult it is to convert to fiat, back in my day, <laughs> when we had to buy Bitcoin, young man, I had to go to a... I remember this very clearly. The way I first bought Bitcoin was I had to go to a 7-Eleven, where I used one of those red MoneyGram terminals to call someone up and pay a bill to a bill provider that was called ZipZap that transmitted that money to BitInstant, Charlie Schrem's company, that then sent me Bitcoin. And I did that four or five days in a row. Then I sold that Bitcoin when it uh, went up to like $7, because it was oh, like yeah. a great return. <laughs> <laughs> we all share regrets, right? Yeah. But I mean, it was really hard. Or trying to put money into Dwala in order to wire it to Mount Gox in, to, in early 2013. Or and meeting some weirdo you met on the internet on local bitcoins. Like me. You don't know if you're going to come back from that meeting. <laughs> well, this was so much of a problem that in early 2013, I got a group of people in New York together. We thought, why don't we just meet up in a park as a group and just made it be known in the city, in New York City, that every Monday from five to nine, we'll just have a communal group there. And it was this notion that meeting a one-to-one -one transaction, there could be some insecurity there. But if you had this trust network of 10 or 20 people that knew each other, you can sort of join that group and sort of get that safety of that crowd. Um, and that sort of became known as a Satoshi Square. And that was this notion that, look, we don't know what's going to happen with Bitcoin. We don't know what's going to go on. But in the you know, 8,000 years that we've had civilization, a government has never once been able to stop people meeting in a park and doing whatever it is that they want to do. Um, and uh, I have a question about that, Jonathan. Yeah. Did you have enough like liquidity during those? Like, If there's 20 people in a park, <laughs> are there enough people who want to buy and who want to sell that they can find m matches? Or As it, I like, remember it. Cult? the transaction volume was five figures, and that was the publicly disclosed transaction figures mm, of the few so hours bad. that was there. Right. Most of the transaction volume was people testing the waters with other people to understand who they were, um, and then taking transactions off channel. And it, the, the notion of the Satoshi Square was to create a trust, um, a web of trust seed 
that people can then build off of and then take offline those connections. And a lot of those people who met during those, those days still know each other and can make calls to each other and sort of engage in that web of trust. And this sort of gets to another question or a topic that Adam and I were talking about, which was before November 2013, we didn't even know Bitcoin was legal or not. Yeah. Like if everyone in Bitcoin was a criminal and like we'd be getting knocks on the doors. It was a big problem in the early days. I remember the first time I bought Bitcoin, actually the first time I didn't buy Bitcoin was in 20, I think 11. And I uh, contacted a guy on Bitcoin Talk named Bitcoin Morpheus. And uh, he was, uh, I think he was- Sounds in, legit. It was, it was super legit. It was super legit. <laughs> I think that like, he was in Washington, D.C. or something like that, and you mailed him cash in an envelope. And then, <laughs> and then, <laughs> it was that, great. That doesn't feel shady at all. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, it was great. I actually wound up, so when I actually wound up, did wind up buying uh, some Bitcoin, it was from, uh, from uh, the Cassatius coins. Right, like the physical bitcoins. I was like, all right, this guy, ha you know, this guy Mike has his uh, name out there, and he was, you know, presenting some legitimacy. And it was at a time when it was very risky, and he actually had to shut that business down because the FBI showed up and said that he was essentially money laundering. I think that was what it was. Oh, it was money transmitting. Money transmitting. Like yeah, that. that it was illegal he money transmitting. He couldn't sell them at first for fiat currency. He, right. That he could sell them for bitcoins, but then it was like, What's well, the point? It, exchange <laughs> well, your bitcoin for so bitcoin. So the, the, the way that it worked bitcoin. was that he was selling preloaded Cassatius coins. And the notion was that they had tamper-resistant seals on there. So you knew for a fact that the person had to destroy the Cassatius coin in order to take the money off of it. And in order to protect consumers, they then legally forced him to sell into the market empty Cassatius coins that didn't have the tamper-resistant seal broken, which entirely broke the notion that maybe you would knew that it, because it wasn't broken, it actually had the money on it. You know, I mean, these days, by comparison, it's so easy. It's just, I mean, like, thinking back to those early days, especially before we started the show, and in those special days when we just didn't know if this was even something that it was okay to associate yourself with publicly, or, and it was a risk to do so. You know, like, we j it was so hard to participate. And now, even though the barriers are still tall, it's like we've got, we've built this gigantic ladder, right? And so it's only like the last three feet. You got to scramble over, you got to have the guts to get over that. But once we're there, wait, did I just make a Trump thing? <laughs> well, listen, I, I, I think one of the things that's important to realize is that we didn't have that perspective then. No. And what I want to remind you all is that your experience today is the one that you're going to be recounting. 10 years from now, and you're going to be going back in my day. We had to sign up for Coinbase and Chase bank account, closed down because they didn't allow Bitcoin. Now, of course, we all know that the entire banking system runs on cryptocurrency, and it's easy for you kids. Uh, I mean, we are all experiencing that. That's what it means to be part of this moving experience, this moment in history where you are in the front rows. All right, we have time for one question, if there's a question on the topic of the risks of being involved or anything related to the fiat bottleneck that we've talked about. Yes, sir. Hi, thank you for taking my question. Um, about the bottleneck and the on-ramp, don't you think that the uh, governments and the uh, World Bank associations will do anything in their power at, at, at a point where they see that is, uh, they have to do it? to make sure that nobody can buy Bitcoin, for example, on Coinbase. We have to go back maybe to uh, meeting people in coffee shops again. Give that man a shirt. Um, <laughs> thank you for that question. Lock mind. <laughs> Who wants to take it first? Well, if you want to be conspiratorial, in 2015, Rand, the uh, consulting corporation for the DOD, wrote a report called The National Security Implications of Virtual Currencies Implemented for Non-Nation State Actors. You can read that paper. It's 80 pages of what Rand Corp thinks the U.S. government could do if it ever wanted to kill Bitcoin. Uh, most of it wouldn't work, but it's a really fun read regardless. Give us the cliff notes. Um, Sorry, I put you on the spot. <laughs> the cliff notes were that they were really, report. really into zero-knowledge proofs. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. So if you want to find out what happens if you try to completely ban all transfers and create an environment where 
it is impossible to do or near impossible to do where the threat to your life is very, very real. Take a look at what's happening right now in Venezuela. And that is a, a very salient lesson because what's happening in Venezuela is they're doing all of that and it is failing miserably. We're reading now that one of the interesting things that's happened is there was a website uh, that was called the Bolivar Dollar or Dollar Today, uh, which gave you the exchange rate against the US dollars. Um, the government seized that domain and started feeding false exchange rates in order to fool Venezuelans to think their money actually was worth something. Um, so they stopped using the U.S. dollar as a reference. We're now hearing uh, rumors, at least for now, that they're using the Bitcoin daily rate as the official reference of value for the Bolivar. And guess what they're going to use? And every now and then they have a meeting in the park at very, very great personal risk, and a cop shows up, and guess what kind of bribe they're going to take? <laughs> Bitcoin, and only Bitcoin. It doesn't work. They can't stop it. It's going to happen in the places where it's most needed, where the risk is greatest, where, but where the value of this is life or death for these people. And maybe it's going to get really, really inconvenient for you. Um, here in the United States, which you know, most of us really don't need necessarily need life or death need uh, cryptocurrencies. But you know, if they show their cards, if they play that game, we'll play. Yeah, I don't think it's possible to stop people from using Bitcoin. I mean, <laughs> and I was thinking about what you said, Adam. Like, oh, <laughs> we're back. Back in 2013, you were saying that it was risky, like people didn't even know if it would be a criminal activity to be even involved in Bitcoin or have any Bitcoin. And I remember at certain points like saying, hey, uh, you know, do you know about Bitcoin? I would like try to educate new people about it. I'd say, hey, I'll, I'll send you some. I you know, have some on my phone. All you have to do is install this wallet. And they'd, it was like a hot potato. It was like, oh, I don't want any of that on my phone. Ooh, get it away from me. It's icky. <laughs> And I guess I never felt that way. I, I guess I was just, maybe this was stupid, but I was too excited to be, about the technology to be worried about like what might, may or may not happen to me, you know, because well, we of were being excited about it. Oh, sorry. Yeah, no, you go ahead. I was saying we were looking for solutions too. I mean, I think that that's the differentiation between, you know, or it's not a, not a differentiation. It's the reason why the technology was so interesting early on was because the current system and not just money, but so much of so many of the current systems that we live under just suck. And it's not because like it can't be done better, it's because that's just the way we do it, and maybe it didn't used to be done better. And so Bitcoin always represented this thing that just was better. It was just better in so many different ways to the options that we had available. And so the idea that something like that not only was better, but was unstoppable at you know, any sort of centralized level is such a powerful idea, and it's why I've devoted the last five years of my life to this thing. And like I said, I created three different podcasts under false names, not my own name, uh, you know, from 2011 through 2013. No, I'm sorry, I did two under my own name in 2013. Um, uh, because, again, like the time wasn't right for it to go mainstream. The time wasn't right even for people who weren't mainstream but were just early adopters looking for a better way. For so long, it was such a technical topic. And so in 2013, it kind of started to open up. And it started to say, OK, maybe this is real. But this actually leads me into our next topic, which is a better Bitcoin technically. right? So from a technical standpoint, thinking back to those early days, one of the things that really stands out to me as being I felt at the time was sort of difficult, but in hindsight, oh my God, it was so difficult. We didn't used to have hierarchical deterministic wallets. We used to have to, I remember having to uh, back up my wallet.dat file. 32, 50 transactions, because otherwise, if you restored, your wallet wasn't keeping track of what address. It was just generating random addresses for you. And this was, again, back at a time when people were very much thinking about security, right? And so every transaction had its own thing. Now that's also true, but we do it much more safely. I'm curious what other types of things like that you know do you remember that were just ridiculous back then that maybe they're not great now but we're still so far ahead relatively speaking oh just multi-sig that works well mm. I mean that's been a huge improvement huge improvement in terms of security and just in terms of the difficulty of having to like it's we moved from the hot wallet 
for everybody to the everything but hot wallet, except for the change that you want to actually have accessible to you. I cringe when I think of those single wallet addresses and like people would reuse like vanity addresses all the time or they have like one blockchain.info wallet that they would, there, there would be, you look on the block explorer, there'd be like hundreds of transactions from the same wallet. And that not, not only like hurts your privacy, but like other people that you're transacting with. So I don't know, I'm glad we have options now. I like how this entire show is turning into the grandparents of Bitcoin reminiscing. Uh, like, I know, we need rocking chairs up here. Back in my day, we didn't have hardware wallets. <laughs> back in my day, we didn't have HD wallets. Back in my day, there was only one mobile wallet. The Bitcoin wallet by Andreas Schulbach, remember that? Yeah. Like one for Android, because Apple banned wallets yeah. on their platform until the end of 2014 almost, right? It was, a, it was a great moment for an Android bigot like myself to just look <laughs> at a Mac user and say, you're just not a part of the new world. You're, you're, you're going to get left behind. You're, this ship is sailing, my friend, and you've got to jump ship. I think cryptos might be too complicated for an Apple user, but wait a few years, we'll make them simpler. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a stupid thing to say, because if a technology is too complicated, we're never going to get mainstream adoption. It's like, whose job is it to make it simple? Like, our job. So, uh, oops. But, okay, yeah. Mm. It's still fun to say. <laughs> All right, do we have any questions? Hey, Andres, and everyone else. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no. Ouch. You, you, you mentioned We're the how peanut you, gallery. Not cool. <laughs> you, you, you mentioned how you haven't bought any Bitcoin since 2013, and how there might be a movement towards actually earning the, the currencies for the network. And I thought that was a very important point that you made because. Every protocol has, you know, this demand side and supply side that you need. Um, in Bitcoin, it's obvious the miners provide this secure transaction for us to all engage in this peer-to-peer -peer exchange of money, and it's incentivized by the system of them being able to get paid um, in new issuance of bitcoins. And today, that's between 15 and 20 million dollars. So, how can that incentive system be mimicked in other systems? And how important is it that people have? Um, the capability of earning their tokens by contributing to the network. You know, I, I don't think you need to contribute to the network, and I think that's the difference between the early days where the primary development of the economy in Bitcoin was directly through subsidy. And that was very intentional. You could read about it in the, in the Bitcoin white paper. And we see this in, in, in other systems, too, whether it was you know, the Ethereum pre-mine or all of the ICOs. The initial stage is, is not in any way focused on earning. Uh, it's, it's, it's focused on bootstrapping the network through some form of subsidy. And I, I think that probably is necessary, and there are good ways and bad ways to do it. But I think what gets interesting is when you earn it purely for labor that has nothing to do with supporting the network. And one of the interesting things I've noticed is this idea of a risk premium, which is the harder it is to get the cryptocurrency, the more it's worth if you earn it. Like, let's take, for example, in the last month we've seen that uh, in India they're cracking down on bank accounts for all of the exchanges, which is grinding their exchange platforms to a halt. What is going to happen next? Right now, if you want to buy uh, Bitcoin with Indian rupees, you pay a 15 to 20 percent premium on the international exchange rate. And that's not because Bitcoin is more expensive in India. It's because rupees are discounted, if you get my drift. Um, but what happens when they close down the exchanges is that premium goes up to 30, 35 percent. And then that means that somebody who earns Bitcoin by doing web design or some outsourced service where they can have a customer either inside India or outside India who pays them in Bitcoin, they turn around and try to sell that on the cash market. They earn a 35% premium. Now think of that in terms of remittance fees. Western Union charges them 2 to 5% to transmit money from the US to India. Bitcoin's remittance fee is now minus 35%. 
because you can earn a premium on the other end, because there's no way to do it other than cash. Well, that's a huge incentive. That means that a lot more people are going to find much better ways to earn Bitcoin from abroad, turn that around, make the 35% premium, and trust me, there's plenty of demand to pay for that in cash in lots of local markets. And, and I think a very important nuance to that is that if you have family or friends that are in India, that they can earn and they can be cost competitive now, or they can charge 35% less, say pay me in Bitcoin, undercut the market, and make just as much as they normally do right now. When something is really hard to get, and you're willing to put that work in, the difference in price you get is called a risk premium. I'd like to see somebody driving a Lambo that has a license plate that says risk premium. <laughs> I think another example of the risk premium is, again, getting back to the grandpa days, uh, you know, talking about, again, like when uh, Satoshi Square and these other kind of pop-up events started happening, I mean, that's a risk premium too. People took a risk, there weren't very many people who were willing to do it, and those people wound up making a good decision in hindsight. You could apply that to starting a, a Bitcoin company or venture or anything like that? Well, okay, so now having started a Bitcoin company or a venture, I can say that that's probably not the best way to spend Bitcoin, but that actually takes us into our next topic. Bitcoin at the, in the early days uh, was like the idea was that you don't just get Bitcoin, you get Bitcoin and then you spend Bitcoin and then you replace the Bitcoin using dollars most of the time, right? Or you continue to get paid in Bitcoin. And so the idea was is that over time we were migrating out of kind of the legacy system and more and more and more into the new system where we figured early on that the greater the friction would be as we talked about kind of in an earlier topic the greater the incentive for people who were disenfranchised by the current system for whatever reason to stay in Bitcoin forever. And it's not just Bitcoin, of course, it's cryptocurrency. Because the bottleneck isn't, you know, getting into Bitcoin, it's getting into cryptocurrency. It's just that Bitcoin is the easiest thing to actually get and it's become the gateway kind of to this entire universe. So, uh, I mean, the question here is, you know, now we're kind of looking at Bitcoin as this global gold system, right? This better way to, to replace what gold should perform in the economy. Um, and the idea that you spend it, you know, it, it's interesting because I have many stories, which I've told before and I won't bore everyone with again, about spending early Bitcoin, right, on things that seemed like a great idea at the time. I will tell one story. Um, <laughs> so uh, it was... Um, Nine months ago, uh, nine months ago, <laughs> uh, one of the earlier people who we uh, pulled onto the show, I think it was episode nine, was um, Andreas Peterson. Um, Andreas Peterson worked for Mycelium early on and then would go on to found a company called Mindbox, which was acquired recently. Um, and they built uh, essentially a network attached storage device, basically your own personal cloud storage that used distributed storage protocols like Storage and SIA to, um, uh, you put all your stuff on it, it would then use any spare space you had to pull content off of the network and earn fees from providing storage for other people, and then it would use the money that it earned on that network to back up your files onto the network. And so you get this kind of your own personal cloud plus this thing. So it was about $1,400, so I spent about two Bitcoin on it. I just got it delivered last week. So I, I was, uh, again, struck by the fact that even though I've learned this lesson like six times since 2013, I continue to make the same mistakes over and over again. So I mean like, w even if it's not for spending anymore, like, can you help yourself? Is it really a mistake though, Adam? Because yeah. like, okay. It was a $14,000, $2,000 purchase. I, I had a, I had a, I think it was a, what is it? A 50 or 80 Bitcoin mistake which is, uh, there was this thing called summer. <laughs> During summer, I don't have this thing called college. And then the fall came and I said, hmm, do I want 80 Bitcoin or do I want to go to college this semester? <laughs> and I decided to do the dumb thing and go to college. An expensive education. Yes. <laughs> and then by the end of that semester, it was like $90,000 for that, that one damn semester. So you're saying student loans really would have saved This you. is the only time that's ever been said. <laughs> all right. I mean, we let's, all let's, have stories like that, but well, like I said before, is it really a mistake? Because it's, I look at it as more of a stepping stone. I mean, the guy who bought two pizzas for, what was it, 10 million Bitcoin? 10,000 Bitcoin. 10,000 Bitcoins. 
you know, he gets picked on all the time. But he doesn't look at it as a mistake because it had to be done. That transaction had to be done to establish the value of Bitcoin because somebody was willing to exchange something for it. And so that's a starting point for a negotiation that goes on forever and for years about the price or the value of Bitcoin. And so I, I don't look at it as a mistake. If you need something at a certain point in time and you have something that you're willing to exchange for it, then it's, it's a win-win at that point in time for both parties. You don't know if you would have spent it in the future at an even worse price point, or you don't know what would have happened. You could get hit by a bus tomorrow. So I don't look at it as a mistake. I, I, I think we all have those regrets, right? But at the end of the day, we got something we wanted. We probably still have some Bitcoin. So yeah, yeah, it all works out. I mean, you got to think about it another way, which is by participating in this economy, by participating in this technology, you're transmitting your investments in currency into an investment in skills. Um, so let me go for my little story. Back in my day, uh, and this is not a Bitcoin story. This is 1986, and I was a teenager, and I was earning money uh, mostly by pirating software in Greece. It wasn't a crime at the time because they hadn't figured out how to make it a crime yet. Um, and I earned pocket money. And what did I decide to do with that pocket money? I invested in a technology that was way overpriced and way too early. In 1986, I bought a 1,200-baud modem that was the size of this monitor speaker. It cost me over 1,200 US dollars, which in Greek money for a teenager at the time was an unthinkable amount of money. And I used it to then run up a crazy phone bill connecting to BBSs in Los Angeles to learn how to program Unix. That's why I'm here today. And without that, without that, I wouldn't be here. Because that's what got me into BBSs. That's then what got me onto UUCP, which then got me onto TCP IP and onto the internet. Three years later, I had a connection to the internet. And in 1989, that put me in a group of maybe 300,000 people all over the world. And I was 17 and a half years old. So these investments allow you to build the kind of skills and to expose yourselves to things before other people and be a pioneer. I don't think that's a waste. I think it's an investment. But, but But I paid three Bitcoin for my first Trezor, <laughs> <laughs> just to bring it full circle. That, that sort of gets back to you know, those without means who think how they can get involved in this space. I, I had a cousin at the height of the Bitcoin price uptick last year say, should I put $6,000 into Bitcoin right now? I said, just like, that's an ungodly amount of money for him to spend on anything that is just discretionary. And I, it's just like for all these people looking at Bitcoin and saying like, look, we understand this is a bubble, this might blow up. Don't invest in it. Like, don't invest money, especially money you can't lose. And if you look at the, the dot com bubble, it wasn't the investors who made out like bandits. They got wiped out. It was the people who said, I think this thing called the web is really interesting. Maybe I should be a web developer. I think this thing called the web is interesting. Maybe I should be a product manager. I think this web thing is interesting. Maybe I should go into marketing and understand web marketing. It's not all about programming. I mean, now the web is so pervasive that we don't even realize how many non-programming jobs involve the web. But if you're thinking of where value can be put and you're not one of means, I would just say look at the time to acquire the skills that will then put you in the position to be one who makes value. Because all those people who said, I want to be a web developer in 98 are doing very fine. They did very fine then. They did very fine in 2002. They did very fine in 2012. They're doing very fine right now. The people who put money in didn't, but the people who put their time and talent in did. And if you don't have means, you should be looking at being a part of the new world, not just speculating on it. Uh, uh If you think it's too late for that, just remember of how many million people in the greater Chicago area are not in this theater tonight. You know, we still haven't found kind of our AOL moment yet. We're still so, I mean, it feels like it's been so long because we've been doing this for five years, but ultimately we're still so far away from actually creating the type of change that we envisioned five years ago. 
that, you know, I, it still really is a cliche almost to say at this point, but the day is still so early. And there's still so much left to do. And one thing, you know, so I commented that it's, so if your goal is to make money, then starting a business with Bitcoin is not always the best bet. But if your goal is to learn a lot about this, that's really been my journey over the last five years, is I started this as a podcaster, with a background in podcasting and working on games and stuff like that, but not as a developer. And it's through the process of building the company tokenly over the last four years to build out many of the use cases that I've been so excited about for that amount of time that I learned how hard it is to actually do these things in real life. And that is such a valuable lesson, and it's really changed my perspective. I found myself in the awkward position on an interview a couple of weeks ago, actually having a long conversation defending uh, people who have launched ICOs. Because as an entrepreneur, you're looking for ways to kind of maximize your impact while minimizing your cost. And ICOs from the outside look amazing for that, or at least they used to, now not so much. But they used to look really good. And the incentive, that's the thing that you follow. So. It's a long way of saying that the involvement is kind of the end goal if your goal is to become involved, right? If your goal is to change things, we don't know yet what needs to be changed. We don't know what the Google of our space looks like yet. I'm pretty sure it's not anything that's out there right now. And maybe it's some obscure altcoin, you know, that has, it's actually built around a specific application, or maybe it's just another layer, a third layer on top of Bitcoin built on top of Lightning, and we finally get to that point where the complexity is low enough that you can just forget that it's anything other than money, and you can just use it as money. And that opportunity is the, you know, that's going to be the biggest company in the space that figures out how to do that and actually pulls it off right. And no one has done that yet, and anybody in this space could be the one that does that. I think another moment that you might know Bitcoin has had its AOL moment is, or blockchain in general, is that uh, Steam as a project in this space is unique or novel in one way, which is that 40%, 40% of the people who access that website happen to be female. <laughs> and that's like a good statistic for this industry. <laughs> like, <laughs> the fact that 52% of the human race represents 40% of the utilization we'll of a single app <laughs> is the best indicator for like, oh, look, we're, we're targeting, we're growing mainstream. <laughs> Just shows how entirely immature this technology is even towards adoption. Like, or, 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 or even towards UX that is understandable or engageable in a meaningful way. Do I have to tell? Oh, do I have to tell my Bitcoin regret story to end the segment? <laughs> if you want. I spent about one Bitcoin on one of those massaging recliners from Overstock.com. <laughs> <laughs> I do not regret that. <laughs> I am really happy with that purchase. Thank you very much. By the way, I have a I have a LT Bip. I have a suggestion for LT Bip number two. Please. All stories have to start with back in my day. <laughs> what do you guys think about that? I don't know. We might have to vote on that. Uh, concept <laughs> back. Uh, ack. All right. All right. So, uh, all right. So um, our next topic, we touched on just a little bit there. But, okay, so we used to call this altcoin innovation. Now it feels like it's ICO, same ring around the bush. But uh, I I'm curious, you know, like in the early days, Altcoins were Bitcoin with one variable change, right? I remember Litecoin was Bitcoin with a different mining proof of mining. You guys have heard of Litecoin, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay, okay, yeah. That was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> um, my, uh, my favorite fork in 2013 was uh, Feathercoin. Indeed. Which was just, it was, the, the, entire, the entire sale for Litecoin initially was the, the metaphor that it was the silver to Bitcoin's gold. And if you talk to anyone involved with Litecoin, they're like, well, yeah, silver's a thing, so if gold's <laughs> gonna be a thing, obviously silver's gonna be a thing. Um, and then Feathercoin came about, and for a, a three beautiful weeks, just <laughs> amazing, just because you could just troll any Litecoin person, said, we're gonna be the copper to the <laughs> silver to the Bitcoin's gold. It makes sense to me. It, it made so perfect it's going to line the pipes that go to the toilet? <laughs> <laughs> Ouch. Ouch. Whatever happened to Feathercoin? Ouch. Uh, it went all the way up and then it went all the way down. 
but still not at zero. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting that nothing really goes to zero. And we've nope. even seen projects get resurrected, you know, like Doge is an example of this, where it pretty much died. And I, then it, as, as, as someone who Doge never who's, dies. As someone who is the, uh, uh, the sad owner of a token that actually went to zero, who would one day like to see his 10,000 coin yay worth something again. <laughs> I would like to say that not all cryptos never go to zero because a cease and desist from Kanye West is apparently the only way to kill a blockchain <laughs> in all of recorded history. Well, he just tweeted decentralized today. Just one word, decentralized. <laughs> nice. So maybe Kanye coin is coming back. <laughs> <laughs> maybe my paper wallet's going to be worth a dollar again. <laughs> keep hodling, Jonathan. Just, <laughs> just keep holding on to it. So since that time, you know, we've seen the introduction of uh, Turing complete smart contracts. We've seen just a lot of new technologies. DPoS was mentioned earlier. And these are different attempts to solve different hard problems that have come up in the space. You know, it's, again, it's still such early days, and we really don't know. We know that Bitcoin is really good at proof of work, and we know that proof of work is useful. But there are elements to it on the scaling side and on just in general. There's all kinds of things that we don't yet really know, certainly. So I'm curious, not necessarily on the scaling side, but just from a technology standpoint, what are you looking forward to that's kind of coming from the alts that perhaps Bitcoin could include in a later point? Or maybe not. Maybe it's just a different way of doing things. I'm going to pass on that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I really try not to make predictions like that because the most amazing things come completely unexpectedly from places I wasn't even looking at to address problems I wasn't even thinking about in ways that I couldn't even imagine. And I'll give you just three examples um, from the last few years. The first one was Segwit. If you understood what SegWit was trying to do, which was solve the transaction malleability problem, when, when Luke Dasher figured out a way to do it as a soft fork, and then suddenly this full-blown proposal to do SegWit as a soft fork came out, and it was like, holy shit, we can fix transaction malleability and do it without a hard fork, which isn't going to get consensus. That was like, okay, I didn't even imagine that you could do soft forks like that. So that was surprising to me. Then one day I hear about this message that dropped in the Bitcoin IRC um, from a guy who was using Harry Potter analogies and dropped a single Tor onion site with a paper on it fully formed called Mimblewimble that blew every cryptographer's mind in the space. Came into the IRC, dropped an encrypted link, disappeared forever. And in there was an idea that is still like reverberating throughout this space, Mimblewimble. Uh, no one was expecting that. No one had any clue we could head in that direction. And then Lightning Network just like unfolded all of these new possibilities that, from, a, from a simple paper that picked up on some of the ideas Satoshi discussed to where we are today. And these are black swans. They're like completely unexpected events. They can't be predicted. You cannot extrapolate from the previous ideas. Um, you know, like the saying that says, um, you know, the automobile was not a series of continuous improvements on a horse. Right? <laughs> it's it's disruptive. It's radical, and it completely changes the direction in which you're going. And if there's one thing I've learned from the last five years is that Bitcoin is a black swan machine. Uh, and it is a black swan machine because the internet is a black swan machine. And it will keep creating these completely unexpected things. So why even try to predict? Just like remain open, keep reading every day, and expect that tomorrow could be the day you read something mind-blowing that you never expected. Another thing that's nice about Bitcoin and all of this stuff is that it's all permissionless, right? That's really what creates the environment in which we can have all of these surprises come out, because there's no central point of control. There's no, right. you have to ask these people for permission in order to do your thing. If you have an idea, you see that it's going to work, whether it's going to succeed or not, right? You can do it. And it's that experimentation and the spirit of the freedom of that experimentation that's really taken us to where we are now. Yes, once the Bilderberg group votes on it, it's in. <laughs> The, the thing that I 
was most interested in with Bitcoin in the early days was this notion of something that was different. And, you know, you look at the, the Keynesian mindset, and it's the notion of the one. That what's going to be the one solution? What is the thing? What is the thing? What is the, the, the solution? You know, how is this going to kill the dollar? And I go, it won't. It's just so distinctly different than the dollar that I know that there's a market for that. You know, they used to joke about communists coming to America, and they go, why do you need 37 different flavors of soup? Shouldn't you just have soup? You know, it's this notion that a multiplicity is always better for the market because then they get to decide what they want. And as you look at different methods to describe blockchains, I, I think that Bitcoin's amazing and it's beautiful and maybe it is the solution for digital gold. But the multiplicity of, 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 of anything is what gives it its value and its unique creation. And there are things that Bitcoin will never want to change about itself. I think immutability is one of them. I think that there is this insane fixation on the number 21. Um, but um, that other blockchains will not have those hangups and will be able to test assumptions and different uh, variables in ways that Bitcoin never wants to because that's perfect, it's fine, it doesn't need to change. But other people can change and do weird things. And you know, when you look at blockchains and how fundamentally immature they are, it's sort of a joke where you know, people go, is Ethereum gonna kill Bitcoin? And it's like, I don't know, did HTML kill C? You know, it's, it's like, it's this, this and, and, and it's, you talk to an Ethereum person and they're so deluded. And it's this notion, no, but Bitcoiners are too. Bitcoiners are too. And it's this We're notion that, no, no, but it's this notion that a, an immature protocol can be everything to everyone and be at, at all solutions. And there's, there's only one thing in, in biology that thinks that it can be everything to everyone and be anything it wants to be. And that is an infant. It's a child. And it's because it hasn't experimented and grown and understand what it can do and what it can't do and what it likes to do and what it doesn't like to do. And as it matures says, you know, I'm really good at this, but I really enjoy that. And that's what I want to be. And as these protocols mature, they're going to make decisions and understandings about what they want to be and what they're good at and what they're not. And just by that simple process alone, they're going to be so fundamentally different that the question, you know, does SIA compete with storage, compete with Filecoin, is as silly as going to saying, does CSS compete with JavaScript, compete with, you know, a Lisp? You know, it's, they're, just, they're just so fundamentally different. And it's, it's, it's sort of a consequence, an unfortunate consequence of the immaturity of all these systems, that they all think that they're competitors. And not just that if all of them just continue on their paths with their different understandings, that you'll find out that there's an entire ecosystem that's the better just because of all of their existences. That's a great rant. Um, Maximalism is centralization by another name. We haven't taken any questions for a while. Do you want to take an audience That's question? That's a good point. We can take an audience question. We'll have too many shirts left over. It's true. We, have, we need to get some more mining done. Well, thank you for taking my question. My name is Yamu, I'm from China. Uh, I'm still pretty new to the space, and um, I feel extremely lucky to be here tonight because I'm surrounded by both the dreamers and the uh, people who can you know, bring the the uh, dream to, into re, uh, re reality. Um, and my question for you is, how do you envision the blockchain technology will help the financially disadvantaged, especially in underdeveloped or undeveloped countries, to reduce inequality in the world? Did you see our topic list? <laughs> <laughs> That's the next topic. Give, give that man a shirt. Our next topic is banking for the other six trillion. Let's go right into it. That's oh, it. <laughs> yeah, that was it. Sorry, right. Yeah, so... Um, well, this is Andreas's topic. This is Andreas's topic. This is the one you've been championing basically since the beginning. It's the remittance use case, but it's so much more than that. So, one of the things that really influences me is uh, I grew up in Greece. Uh, you probably know this already. I grew up in a place where um, things were not rosy. Things were not uh, empire. They were post-empire. Um, you know, Americans will become familiar with this idea soon enough. <laughs> <laughs> but Greek culture is now, or can be summarized very much as a, the cultural equivalent of, back in my day, we invented geometry. Um, but 
part of the part of the challenge of growing up in that environment is that by the time I was 18, I'd experienced three major currency crises: bank runs, uh, massive devaluations, taking a couple of zeros off the end of the currency, replacing the notes, banks closing, uh, sudden crises. All of these things, and these deeply affected my family, which deeply affected me. I mean. Uh, not in a life or death way, in a eh, middle class kind of, I can't get the toys I want this Christmas. Don't take this as a sob story, but it, it, it affected me because I saw what happened around me, and I saw that money is the thing that you can ignore until it stops working, and then everything is about the money that doesn't work. Everything else stops working. It's one of those crazy abstractions that um, you can safely ignore as long as it's working. And I experienced that. And I also experienced living in a place with corruption and bureaucracy and bribes and all of these different things, which continue. And one of the things that I still believe today is that is the world. It's not this. It's not what you experience. That's the exception. So, as 5% of the world's population, the most powerful economy in the world, you don't get to experience how the world works in other places. And so, when people say, eh, who needs Bitcoin? Um, I know who needs Bitcoin. I've seen it. And it was really brought to me very strongly. If you remember, I think my tenor and attitude changed right after the first LibitConf, when I went to Argentina. And I met the local community in Argentina, and they had had it far worse than Greece. And they had some just horrifying stories. And I realized how far they would go to preserve this, and to fight for um, monetary independence, for currency independence, for decentralized uh, economics, for access to global markets, for a chance for a future for their children. Here's the problem. I know a lot of people are disappointed nowadays. They're like, oh yeah, you said a good story about the other six billion, but you know, with the fees we have today, or that story is dead. It's not dead. We're not even getting started yet, and it's going to take time. Trust me. Um, but it is happening, and it will happen. It might happen through Bitcoin. It might happen through something else. I'm not going to make that bet yet. But what I do know is that when you open the world up and you open the world economy, there are so many people who just have this incredible thirst for something that will give them freedom or even just hope. And when I visit various places around the world and I have these conversations again and again and again, it reminds me why we do this. And it's because still today there are so many billions of people who have no access to the basic financial tools that we take for granted. So that's the story, and I think we still have that vision. We just have to. I've been disappointed that we haven't been able to make more progress yet, but I haven't given up. In yeah. <clears throat> in 2013, it was Cyprus. Actually, it was one of the first sort of examples of a country yeah. in crisis where we sort of started talking about could this actually act as a solution, and at the time. You know, again, it was too small, it was too late, that wasn't the solution. Uh, later on, we would go to talk with other people like Jeffrey Tucker, um, who's an Austrian economist, um, about uh, you know, the idea that a nation could actually issue a cryptocurrency and use it. And in the last six months, you know, 12 months, we've started to hear about that, and the first one to come out is the Petro. Uh, it's not actually out yet. Uh, <laughs> it, there are lots of questions about it. Yes, I know. There's lots of criticism about it, and I agree with the criticism. And ultimately, I just want to remind people that the first users of Bitcoin, the first users of cryptocurrency, a lot of them were using it for drugs, <laughs> right? Like this was not like the picture of legitimacy uh, at the time that it was being done. But it didn't matter because they were people who were poorly served by the existing system because the things that they wanted to do were illegal and not supported by it at all. And so they used it because it was useful to them. And it was through that in initial use, it wasn't just drug dealers, of course, uh, and drug users. It was also you know, people who ideologically were disenfranchised by the system. And when I look at what's happening in Venezuela, and recently we've heard similar things from Iran, that they're considering stuff like this as well, 
you know, that's what I see. I see kind of early users who are disenfranchised by the existing system, who are educating themselves on this technology and actually making use of it, whether or not we agree with how they're using it, the fact that they are using it is an indicator that once again the cycle has come around and what was happening at an individual level five years ago, six years ago, seven years ago, is now happening at the nation state level. So while we may think that these are you know, things that perhaps shouldn't exist, I would encourage everyone to keep an open mind just from the perspective of the learning that we will gain from them, whether they succeed or fail, we should feel sorry for people who are in the situation where they are being experimented on. But the fact that an experiment does exist actually is an indication that this is moving in the direction that we've thought all along, which is that eventually these things compete with nation states and nation states launch their own. Yeah, I think there's this trite expression we've all heard, which is the internet treats censorship as a routing problem and routes around it. And that hasn't necessarily been true in many cases, but it has been true in many cases too. Well, in the internet of money, sanctions are uh, censorship, and the internet of money routes around sanctions. And that means the first application for nation-state money will be the nations that are under financial embargoes and sanctions. That's not necessarily the best poster child you want for this kind of uh, technology, but it still showcases the power of decentralization and censorship resistance. Clearly, it's disruptive. I mean, that's the that's the part is that any system that you look at here, the people using it are using it because it's the best option available. And if it's the best option for them now, it's going to be the best option for legitimate players. You know, later on, we didn't see banks come in until what 2000. 14, 2014, 15, and it's not the importance that banks came in, it's the importance that it's an indication to the rest of society that this is something that is becoming normal, and it's through the process of being exposed to it over and over again, whether through good or bad. Most of the coverage of Bitcoin was bad for the first number of years. Everything... Let's, let's do a quick poll in the audience. Um, of the 700 or so people who are here today, how many of you are drug dealers? <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> you know, things change, and one of the things that happens with that particular form of propaganda, or which may have been true in the early days, but certainly isn't today, is that every one of us becomes an example that causes cognitive dissonance. Every time someone meets you and they go, "You're into Bitcoin? What do you do for a living?" and you say, "I'm a dentist," <laughs> right? They're like, that doesn't sound like what I saw on the news. And, and you cause that momentary cognitive dissonance. It's like, this person looks too normal to be using Bitcoin. And you break that story. And it's going to happen again and again. Right now, it's going to be the rogue states that are doing state cryptocurrencies. But one day, it won't. So for the rest of the show, we just have 10 minutes left, folks. Thanks very much for being with us this far. Um, uh, if you'd like to ask questions, we're just going to take questions for the rest of the time. Uh, you, so, sorry, uh, people are waiting in line. Please go to the microphone. Sorry, we're we're going to be taking questions now for the next ten minutes, and then it's done. I apologize. Hello. So my name is Gaetano Carbonar, but on my name tag it says I'm Satoshi. <laughs> Coincidence. And I am age 11, and I would like all four of your opinions on my next question. Um, how do you think Bitcoin? other cryptocurrencies will affect life in the near future? I think that someone has been looking at my list of notes, because that was the topic we were skipping. Yeah, Please. fantastic. Well, um, I think one of the interesting things we don't appreciate is the age gap. Um, so, you're 11 years old now, and you've been involved in cryptocurrencies how long? Are you brand new to it? Yes. Brand new. Okay. So keep in mind, kids that uh, are born today will not only know a world uh, with the internet existing forever, but also a world where cryptocurrencies existed from the very beginning. And think about how that changes their experience. Um, by the time you can open a bank account, which is 16 years old, you will have been using cryptocurrencies potentially for five years. That experience is going to be repeated by kids much younger than you, and that's going to change the world because uh, you will have absolutely no tolerance for what you hear the first time you visit a bank, and what they try to sell you. So, 
when, when I was four, my dad got the first computer for our house, and he just let me play with it. And sort of that experience of just playing with a computer, breaking it, and then trying to fix it before dad got home had taught me almost everything <laughs> I knew about computers. But one of the side consequences of that was my entire understanding of writing and discovery was on a computer. And when I would go to school, and they would have writing assignments, they would say, now write an essay. And I say, I can't. They go, what do you mean you can't? And I go, all I've ever known about writing is writing on a computer. Can I have a computer? And they go, no, you need to learn how to write an essay by hand. And they go, no, but I got to long form it and then rewrite it and change I, I just, I need a computer. And they go, what? So when you get a job, you'll need a computer every time you need to write something? <laughs> and I went, yeah. And they go, that's crazy. So every time you want to send a memo, you're going to spell check it? And I go, yes. And, you know, it's good to see I fought that thought and I won it, but I didn't win it at the time and my grades sort of reflected it. And I feel like the life you're going to be experiencing is going to be very similar to that, where you're going to be right for a very long time before you're proven to be right, and then you're going to wish you kept your teacher's email so you could gloat in their face <laughs> after the fact, because I wish I could now. Um, but I can remember being 16 and wanting uh, to send someone money online and needing to spend hours and hours and hours taking web forums so I can load up a PayPal to then send someone money because it was illegal for me to be able to even have access to commerce online. And that's a world now that you'll never need to know. And understanding how that affect your life is sort of unimaginable. Um, but it's sort of like going to your teacher and saying, I will never write something without a computer. I, I think maybe the world of finance that you might live in it will just be one of entirely crypto, and I have no idea what that'll look like. But you know, getting into arguments with teachers now is something I'd highly recommend for an ego perspective when you grow up. <laughs> I love this question. Um, I think one of the cool things that uh, teenagers and adolescents perhaps will experience, or you'll experience in the next few years, is when I was a kid, I created a lot of content. And at the time, the internet was kind of nascent, so I wasn't really putting it out there that much. But later, I got into podcasting, and it became like a life-changing thing for me. Well, cryptocurrency just makes it so much easier to not only share, but like also monetize that kind of content and to put it out there on the internet and get people interacting with you. We're going to see you know, payment channels and in interesting ways of monetizing content that we've never seen before. And it's going to incentivize the creation of more content and better content and new types of content because we have these new ways to monetize it. So I'm really excited about that. Yeah, so I'd echo a lot of Stephanie's comments and just say that you know, a lot of my life has been kind of devoted to having an idea doing something, onboarding, you know, whether it be a podcast or creating a game or something like that, onboarding a bunch of volunteers who I can get to kind of rally behind that, and then just working, 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 because there was no way to actually, like, pay for it, right? And there's a difficulty that comes when you do start to pay for things, because you can actually offend people when you, when they go from volunteer to you pay them, you pay them too little instead of paying them nothing at all, and that actually a lot of times is worse, and then they, then they leave, it's this terrible thing. Anyway, so, Cryptocurrency, again, like by the internet is so empowering in that way for connection, for coordination, for sharing, for building a following and building a brand. But the money aspect has always been so difficult. And just Stephanie, I think you're totally right on that Bitcoin and cryptocurrency solve that problem. And that is the problem to solve when you're trying to start things because it takes that, that uh, permissionless characteristic and it applies it to whatever it is that you're doing, assuming you can actually get people behind your idea. Thank you very I would much say, for that question. Be prepared for frustration. Mm. One of the things that I find fascinating is how uh, people assume that their current experience and context is normal, will remain normal, and will remain mostly unchanged. And there's no historical evidence for that. All of the evidence is exactly the opposite. You will experience enormous change in a generation, and yet people assume that things have always been the way they were when they were teenagers, and will always be that way, and then they're offended that the world keeps changing around them. You're at this age where you are experiencing the amazing as normal, and you're going to have to spend several decades talking to people for whom the ridiculously stupid is normal. So while you're going, oh my god, you can do a QR code and click it, and they're like, well, my bank closed at 4.30, but hey, that's normal. 
And you will experience this incredible frustration where you can't understand why they can possibly accept that. This inferior, obviously wrong, obviously broken, how they can accept the world is okay like this. It sucks. It's broken. And you rally against that. That's youth. That's what gives us hope for the future. Uh, keep rallying against that. Keep fighting against that. And accept that you will be frustrated for a very long time before you are finally proven right. Yeah. So we're going to take two more questions, and then we are actually going to run over our time. But I really want to take two more questions. So I apologize to anyone who we're not going to get to. Really sorry about that. Uh, next question, please. Hey, what's going on, guys? Thank Give anybody so who's standing in line a shirt. <laughs> Thanks so much for coming. It's uh, it's been a pleasure just listening to you guys. I just got a question about. Um, decentralization and centralization of exchanges and the debate between the two at this time. Um, I mean, we've had things like Ether Delta, but there hasn't really been a solution for people to access Bitcoin in, uh, in a fiat and in a crypto to crypto aspect um, in a decentralized manner that's really taken over. And I just was curious to hear about how you guys see the evolution of that coming on, because that has a lot to do with on-ramps and off-ramps. Yeah, so it's not that that hasn't been tried. It's actually been tried lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of times. The problem is, is that centralization in exchanges has meaningful benefits. They're not benefits in security, they're not benefits in privacy, but they're benefits in convenience and they're benefits in accessibility that are very hard to get around. I was at a conference last week, and uh, a very financial-focused conference, uh, and uh, saw a project that is building a smart contract wallet that actually taps into Ether Delta, all of the other uh, decentralized exchanges, and allows you to use a single transaction to a special smart contract on the Ethereum blockchain that then, like if you want to buy five different things, instead of having to do five different transactions, you just kind of readjust some sliders, and then you click the button, and then it just does it, and it does it all for you. So I think that we're moving towards better solutions, but the problem hasn't been that this isn't some stuff that people like. People like these ideas a lot. They're just really hard to do, and it's hard to fix the problems of a blockchain by using a blockchain. I think when we think about decentralized exchanges, we always have to just go back to basics. The ultimate form of decentralized exchange is person-to-person, peer-to-peer kinds of transactions. So as long as you're looped into a community like this, you can always access decentralized exchanges because you always know people who you can trade with and nobody can really stop you. Yeah, it's a hard problem, and part of it is the outcome of being surrounded by every form of financial service being so horribly centralized and custodial and trusted third party that in order to work with fiat, you have to work with that model. And so the dependence on fiat, which is a necessary evil right now, is the reason that most exchanges are highly centralized. I mean, in Crypto to crypto exchanges work uh, beautifully, and a lot of them are very, very decentralized. And you can do very low friction, high liquidity transfers between different cryptos. So I think we're going to see an explosion in that. Um, you know, the the only way we're going to get rid of centralization in exchanges is by gradually not using not using fiat. Um, when you look at decentralized exchanges, I think the one of the most beautiful things about blockchain is it allows custodyless behaviors. So I'm, I'm interested in custodyless ex, uh, exchanges more so than decentralized exchanges. Uh, Shapeshift is a great example of a, of a custodyless exchange that is still centralized. Um, the problem is that do money doesn't let you do that. Money doesn't let you be custodyless outside of the physical pieces of paper. You're going to have to spell that for us. <laughs> That word. Custodyless. Custodyless. Oh, I get Custodyless. So that's what you were saying. Okay, Cust very Custodyless. <laughs> okay, now I got it. Thank you. Sorry, I, I thought it was a new word. Oh, I'm sorry. I was confused. He's that's really just dessert me. menu. Yeah. We're if, professionals. If, if it makes you feel better, it wasn't until I think I was five I learned to spell my own name. So that, that it's a uh, spelling is not my strong suit. Um, but um, <clears throat> Custodyless exchanges. <laughs> <laughs> I derailed that really bad. Oh, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Come on, keep rolling, keep rolling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and you, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. Oops. Next question, please. Hey, how are you guys? Uh, my question tonight, I guess, would just be simply, um, we've talked a lot, or you guys have talked a lot tonight about how 
Bitcoin is what it is. It has been changing on and on. But with the advent of these new technologies, like the zero knowledge proofs and Zcash, um, Ethereum being programmable, smart contracts, and things of that nature, um, what keeps you guys to Bitcoin and what makes it not antiquated? I understand with the new lightning nodes and all these other things coming towards it. But at the same time, um, I guess I want to ask people with more knowledge and more experience why Bitcoin still. If I could just jump on this first, I think that you look at what blockchain has been able to achieve, and there's a lot of looking at blockchain outside of looking at Bitcoin that's been happening of late. And Bitcoin did this thing called proof of work, and there's a lot of magic in what Bitcoin did, and people are looking at the different aspects of what Bitcoin did and seeing if that magic is still there when you change different aspects of it. And if you look at all of the major blockchains out there, look at Ethereum, they're all moving away from proof of work. And the, the question becomes, if this magical component, this, these magical aspects of a blockchain can still be there when that happens, and how many other blockchains out there are saying, we're going to retain proof of work, we're going to keep going with it, and you find out that when Ethereum switches, how much hash rate is there going to be on proof of work blockchains? You know, I, I think that, you know, Andreas was saying before, maybe all the world needs is one proof of work blockchain and that blockchain will be Bitcoin. And I think from that perspective alone, Bitcoin will have a very secure future in the value that it can provide because I think that there are unique aspects to proof of work that just no other system can do. I, I, I'd like to cue it up for Stephanie by making one comment, which is, I take a lot of cues for this particular thought uh, from evolutionary biology. And a lot of people misunderstand evolutionary biology, and the number one misunderstanding is they think that evolution is a progress from a lesser to a higher being. That it's an increase in sophistication, an increase in level, um, it's evolution to better, um, but it's not. Uh, and it's not survival of the fittest in terms of strongest. It's survival of the thing that fits best within the environmental niche that it occupies. Species expand to occupy an environmental niche, the thing that they are most best adapted to. And evolution is simply filling all of the evolutionary niches that exist with different species that are each trying a different strategy. You cannot be the best land animal and the best sea animal at the same time. You can be the apex lion or the apex shark, but you can't be both. Because everything that makes you perfect for land makes you less perfect for sea and vice versa. And this happens throughout evolution. Evolution is a series of dead ends. It's a series of one-way streets where you develop this incredible trait and it closes the door on all of these other things that you could be doing. You have a proboscis, you can do some things beautifully, but you certainly can't do other things because of that one thing. Ethereum does smart contracts with Turing complete capability, and that is a choice that makes it great for very flexible programmable blockchains. It's causing some problems with security, and it's never going to be, in my opinion, as robust as a very simple script-based stack language like Bitcoin. So, if you want to do, the question is the problem is that we ask the wrong question, and the question we ask is which is the winner, which is the best cryptocurrency, which should immediately be followed by a question: best at what? Because if best at robust global reserve currency is what you're trying to do, we already have one that fills that niche, and it is an apex, and it's doing really well. But it sucks at smart contracts, and it will always suck at being super flexible, because all of the choices that make it a robust global reserve currency make it suck at being flexible. And if you think you can also be flexible, and be the robust global reserve currency, you haven't been paying attention to this argument. Yeah. Maximalism is just centralization. There is no winner-takes-all. There is winner-takes-niche. And she's an actual biologist, so yeah. <laughs> maybe she can tell me where I got that one wrong. <laughs> no, I confirm. I really like the evolutionary biology example that um, different technologies serve different niches. And by function of specializing in a certain one, 
you lose out on the opportunity to specialize in others simultaneously. So yeah, you said it really well, Andreas, I think. And uh, for, I guess for me, why am, I why am I so interested in Bitcoin and why do I focus on it, I guess, with, and why do we with the podcast? Bitcoin was first. It was the archetypical, prototypical example of a game-changing technology that not only changed technological stuff, but changed our lives in so many different ways, from how we think about money to what we will put up with in terms of uh, how we're treated by our financial banking institutions, right? To how much control we have over our own money, and by proxy of that, our decisions, our lives. Suddenly, it goes way beyond money into philosophy. And that's the really interesting thing about Bitcoin to me that got me excited about it in the beginning. And I think because we've had Bitcoin for a while, we've already seen it start to change these different aspects of our lives. And you don't need to look at newer technologies that are coming in later because we can see that archetypical example of how Bitcoin changed those aspects of our lives and we can maybe extrapolate that to other technologies or whatever. Also, there's been a lot of disappointment in terms of other technologies. I mean, Bitcoin was kind of the thing that if you found out about it early enough, you told your friends about it and they were like, oh, come on, you really think this time is different? Oh, it's, it's growing and, you know, it's, it's, going, it's such a great investment, it's going up in value. You know, it's, uh, it's gonna change the world, it's gonna revolutionize banking. And everyone looks at you like, yeah, right. Right? And normally you would say that if someone tried to tell you, oh, I've got this revolutionary new technology that's gonna change the world, you would look at them and roll your eyes and say, yeah, right. Well, Bitcoin proved those naysayers wrong. It, it really did change the world, but not so much for every other technology that was, was similar to Bitcoin or that was based on Bitcoin with, with little tweaks. There's been a lot of disappointment and a lot of scams in those areas. And so, I don't know, I guess that's what, Bitcoin has withstood the test of time. Even though it's only been a decade or so, it has withstood the test of time enough that I feel really confident that it's here to stay and it is the future. And so I think, yes, it is a prototype, it is an archetype, and it is something that we can uh, look at first when we want to study how new technologies are going to change our lives. A great man once said that uh, Bitcoin is punk rock. And uh, I like punk rock, right? I also like other types of music. So it's not so much that, you know, the show isn't about other things. It's that Bitcoin encapsulates most of the interesting parts about what's going on here. And it's not that other experiments aren't interesting too. Like I said, I just brought up the Petro. I mean, <laughs> you know, talk about uh, not uh, really uh, in vogue token to be talking about, but the lessons to be learned are really everywhere. So even though the show is called Let's Talk Bitcoin, we have talked, we did in the early days, talk about changing it to Let's Talk Cryptocurrency or something like that. You know, Bitcoin still is it, and the other thing is that it's so clean, is that Bitcoin compared to everything that's come after it, had such clean motivations in coming out. And it is unique in that it's a successful protocol that never raised money, it just bootstrapped. And that is such a challenge that I really have yet to see any other project do. Even projects you know, that didn't raise much money, they still raised money. And so the cleanness of that, plus the lack of a founder to sort of push us in any direction, that's a powerful thing. And I think that we would be very silly to give it up just because another technology comes along that looks promising. It's not that those technologies aren't interesting and it's not that we're not gonna use them and it's not that you know, we won't talk about them, it's that Bitcoin encapsulates the entire movement in a much better way than cryptocurrency ever could. And that's our show, folks. We'll see you in five years. <laughs> Just kidding. Hey, you guys, let's give it up for the LTV host. Well, how amazing was that? Thank you so much. Please take a bow. Please take a bow.